Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Coleman, and I lead the HANA Chemical Unit, known as the Bio Business Unit. I want to invite you on a line of a message and a story that is 60 years old and five years young. It is 60 years old because in 1952, at the tail end of the Korean War, the original Chairman Kim, who would be the father of the current chairman of HANA Group, decided that Korea needed munitions and explosives. It was a time, as you know, in terms of the war, when those were difficult to, to procure. And from that, in the course of a 60-year history, Hanwha has become a leading, and in some cases, a dominant sector player in Korea. That's the 60 years to this November. The five years young was in 2007, after a strategic review, the current chairman Kim, who is now chairman for 31 years, decided with his then executive team that the growth engines for 2020 would include the following new businesses, solar, clean tech, nano, battery, and biopharmaceuticals, specifically having biosimilars and novels as part of that. And hence was born the bio business unit of HANA Chemical. This is an important slide, not just because the numbers look good, but because it speaks to something which is part of the success of how HANA Bio has been able to develop and indeed license its first biosimilar to Merck last summer. HANA is in the typical Korean sense a chable, a family controlled conglomerate. Of the conglomerates in Korea, of which you will remember ones like Samsung and LG and Hyundai and Kia, HANA rates as the fifth largest by revenues. And you can see that its global reach outside of domestic Korea is quite enormous. It's divided primarily into three major business lines, those being manufacturing, construction, finance, service, and leisure. And the numbers there speak for the types of revenues which come in in each of those areas. When I mentioned about the vision, this was done back in 2007. And you can see here that the solar, biotech, and other holistic services are effectively what we call growth engines for the future, which means that the traditional businesses of HANA Group are expected to do well inside of their own particular sectors and increase share, but the new businesses over the next 10 years are going to be the foundation for the future growth of the next generation of HANA Group. And that's important because in Korea, for those of you who know the country well, part of Korea's economic success is primarily driven by its ability for long-term commitment to strategies and investments. It is not short-term in my opinion and in my experience, and it is Chebels like the Hanwas and the Samsungs and the LGs who look at sectors that they wish to benefit from and wish in some cases to dominate, and then they apply significant investments over long periods of time. Having worked in public companies, I think you will agree with me that that isn't always the case in terms of the way the West looks at its business. They are just a listing of the various um, companies, and if you're a golfer, uh, HANA owns several prestigious golfing courses. I'm a golfer, and a poor one, and I always give my money to the Korean colleagues at the beginning of the game. It's much easier not to carry it around, because I know I'll lose it in any event by the end. I just need to have a good supply of golf balls, which is usually the case. HANA Chemical is the home that we live in and it is a, one of the large chemical corporations of the world. And it, it's a home for the new businesses pro tem, meaning that the solar business will stand alone, the bio business will stand alone, the nano battery will stand alone, but until such time as a certain um, bandwidth of uh, capability and success is achieved, we have a home inside of HANA Chemicals. So my boss is the vice chairman of HANA Group, who is also 
someone who covers many of the various businesses of HANA. I won't dwell on these, that's just solar energy and LNC. Life insurance, if you happen to need it, a very good one in HANA. And then hotels and resorts, some of the finest in the country and around Asia. And let's not forget, even though while we're in Singapore, part of the significant strategy of the HANA Group in general and across all of its businesses is to both understand, access and be successful inside of China. And that includes our bio business very much. So specifically to our business, <coughs> we have a goal and a vision to be a top tier antibody therapeutics company in Asia within the next 10 years. We want to do that not to be exclusively a regional player, but to be regional in terms of our reach, capability-wise, but then through a series of partnerships to be able to secure global and uh, wide-reaching partnerships. And we have three locations primarily, Seoul, where I work uh, with about 20 colleagues, uh, Daejeon, which is the R&D center, which has about um, 70 uh, researchers, and we're just completing the manufacturing plant at 7,000 litres, which has about 30, 35 people. Uh, I won't dwell on this. These slides are so well known at this point that one would have to ask, if you don't know why you went into the business, then you probably shouldn't be in it. But the numbers speak for themselves. And the interesting thing, I think, is that the business of biosimilars, I would hold the opinion, is actually an economically viable one in the long term. Uh, I'm quite convinced of that. I do think it will take a maturation period and it will have an adoption period somewhat similar to generics in Europe but also somewhat different depending on which advanced markets that they are uh, being uh, produced in. This one just confirms that the uh, long-term viability of this business is indeed uh, what HANA has looked at and what we believe is possible. In terms of the resources that I would argue allowed us to be successful with the Merck uh, partnership collaboration. Uh, there is and continues to be a highly skilled workforce in Korea. Large pool of very talented, <coughs> uh, skilled uh, scientists and engineers. Although I would say to you that China has an interesting paradigm. They have the 1000 initiative where the go Chinese government uh, is giving preferential treatment to attract back to China 1,000 leading scientists and engineers every year. And they do various things which are non-Chinese in terms of the way they finance them, they repatriate them, and allow them certain additional benefits that a, a regular indigenous Chinese scientist might not have. I argue very strongly to the Korean authorities that they must do likewise, because there is a huge opportunity to bring back the talent to places like Korea. The R&D infrastructure, very high caliber of universities, the Sky Network, so Seoul, uh, National University, Yonsei, and KAIST, among the best in the world, along with several others. Somebody this morning mentioned the favorable structure in terms of cost, which is there, but importantly, the government policies are extremely supportive. Government in Korea has stated publicly that it wants to have 20% of the biosimilars global market by 2020, and they're putting specific policies and support mechanisms around that in order to make that happen. The challenges for those of you and, and I who are in this business are, are, are very clear, and I, I would hold an opinion that <clears throat> while biosimilars are not innovative drugs, the manner in which you make a biosimilar isn't quite innovative. It, it is by nature of what you have to do extremely complex, extremely difficult to biosimilar, and the previous speaker was very clear in terms of comparability, yes, and then the similarity issues, but uh, these, these are not easily uh, done, they are not easily copied, so to speak. The technical challenges is, you know, the experience in terms of registration. Uh, Korea does lack uh, large-scale manufacturing uh, operations at a level which from a local developer point of view are required, hence we decided to spend <coughs> over $100 million in building our own 7,000 litre plant. And then the challenges in terms of the market, it's, a, it's a, an evolving market relative to the experience of where careers come from. 
The approach that we've had, not surprisingly, is to concentrate on the front end and try to partner out the middle to the latter end. We do not intend to be a 10,000 person company. Merck has 90,000 people. We've, as I said, about 120. Uh, I don't think it's volume or scale. I just think it's uh, which part of the food chain you want to have a desire to be able to play at and play well. And so leveraging the upside of the value chain by establishing strong R&D was the focus, and then minimizing the downside by going outside for partnerships. The approach that we took in terms of the action, the priority focus was R&D capability. And I have to tell you, even though there are none in this room, the researchers and scientists colleagues that I have are among the best in the world. I think they would stand shoulder to shoulder in any biotech pharma company in the world without even a problem. And I'll tell you that because um, when Merck did the deal with us, they told us subsequently that they had gone around the world to look for an etanocept biosimilar. They had two programs of their own. They couldn't find any until they came to ours, and in four and a half months we had a licensed deal. That was the quality of the etanocept HD203. And I'm very proud of my colleagues who were able to put that together. I would add, and this is a business development plug, we're just about to go out on licensing uh, discussions on our next biosimilar, HD201, which is targeting a major biologic also. And I can assure you, any of you who are interested in the audience, the quality in terms of CMC and scientific data and advice that's incorporated there is at least at the standards of the gold standard that HD203 was. And I, ensure, I will ensure that the other two programs follow like Likewise. Let me just move on. <clears throat> so these are the actual programs. Um, the commercial size obviously is important, so we've done a lot of work in terms of the analysis of which biologics would be commercially most attractive and those which would be coming off patent in a reasonable amount of time. <clears throat> so Etanocept is now in phase three in Korea and doing well, uh, and it is the licensed collaboration with Merck. HD201 in non-clinical, or 4 in research, as well as 05 in research. There was the status in 2007. We were basically a neophyte. We were not a player. How do you become a player in the shortest period of time possible? And that's the reason we chose Embryo. If you look at the schema of 07 to 11, <clears throat> they were the phases and there are the things that happened in those various years. Um, I would, I would posit to anyone who is in this business longer than, than a week or two that five years to bring from the initiation of basic research through to where we are is an achievement that I think my colleagues rightly should stand up and be proud of. Uh, it's, uh, it's a testimony, I'd have to say, ladies and gentlemen, to the extraordinary commitment and dedication and absolute drive and passion an unwillingness to not succeed that I see in Korea. I'm the only Western chief executive in the HANA group, and I, that's a good thing and a bad thing depending on which day it is. But I can assure you, I have not seen comparable effort, even in the best of the companies I've worked in. And that's not just time, that is intellectual uh, and capability. Uh, it's just quite phenomenal and it's quite obvious to me as a Westerner to see why Asia uh, is becoming the, the more dominant factor in our world. There are the critical success factors that took us to being able to do the deal. Uh, Non-negotiable is the quality. The earlier speaker spoke about the comparability issues and I will just reiterate on the biosimilarity issues. It is non-negotiable. Do not bring into my office or talk to me about something which doesn't have a gold standard. Why? Because as a businessman, no big farmer is going to be interested in taking second quality. And there are enough biosimilar developers out there to be able to actually, I think, find the quality. So if you want to be number one or second mover, you have to have some absolutes, and those absolutes are there. The transparency in terms of working is a, is a very clear one for us, and I think that also speaks to the partnership model, because um, our particular small little band of, of, of people have a particular culture, uh, and we actually met a very similar culture in the Merck BioVentures uh, team as well, and uh, I, I congratulate the team in Merck for that. In terms of clinical development, we had the bar and standard at advanced markets for the regulators. Uh, we're very pleased we were able to show the regulators in the EMEA uh, and we will do so with Merck and FDA just the standards to which these clinical trials and the data integrity has been, has been arranged and, and trialed. And then from a regulatory point of view, 
uh, very early in the process sought the advice of the regulators and even though in Europe they're a little bit more comfortable with biosimilars, they still had quite a lot of um, discussion they wanted to have with us and we took that on board very readily. So th th this is my final slide. Um, I said to you at the beginning that <coughs> The, the financial situation of Hanwha, it was important. And it's important because if you can sort of extricate yourself from a business that you've been in very successfully, and then ask yourself, where do I want to be in, in, in 10 years successfully? And you come up with businesses that you have no experience in. And you decide that actually you're going to choose some of those that you have no experience in. You don't last, in my opinion, a long time in terms of development unless you have an absolute commitment from the very top of the organization. And the, the top of the organization doesn't have to be chairman. It just has to be the top of the organization. And it has to be committed, unwavering, and visible. Not just go ahead, Paul, and go do it. It has to be communicated time in, time out, not just verbally, but it has to be communicated with investment because you have skeptics in every company, and particularly in a company where you have no track record. So, so it was clear that Chairman Kim's vision and commitment was key. Transferring that to Vice Chairman Hong, who is head of HANA Chemical, clearly he had to be completely on board with this, and he, and he is, was, and is. And, and those sort of commitments are hugely important to executives like myself because when you're down in the operational trenches trying to push something forward which is new, you have to be able to have confidence that behind you people are going to stand for new ideas, new investments, and potentially highly risky situations that they have no feeling of where the benefit risk ratio is. And then you bring around you a highly experienced group of people in the R&D space who have the ability, in my view, to do world-class science, and you bring in the other functions in terms of what they are required, you do outsourcing where you can do it, and you can do it well, which is what we do, and then you put together a quality CMC package with good sound scientific advice from the agencies, and then you go and you talk to the big pharma, and you show them what you have. In my view, we did that successfully with HD203, Etanocept, Embrel, we will do it with our other biosimilars also. Thank you very much. Thank <sighs> you.